Hello and welcome to our next instalment in the CTO series. Uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Graham Cox, the CEO of, of MTEC. Uh, MTEC are a uh, market leading business um, harnessing VR um, within the wearable technology space to uh, monitor and translate human intent uh, and behavior um, to profile that across a number of industries. Um, and Graham can go in and tell us a bit more, but thanks for joining us today, Graham. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Delighted to be joined by you today. Um, can you go into a bit of detail and tell us a bit about MTech yourself and your kind of journey to date? Um, sure. Okay. So let me just briefly start with MTech and then we'll uh, we'll go back from there. So uh, MTech is a project uh, that I started. Um, actually, we started talking about six years ago when I met uh, Dr. Charles Naduka. Um, a, an eminent uh, facial and plastic surgeon based here in Brighton um, in the school playground, as you do, uh, and started talking about our respective work. Um, my background is in artificial intelligence. He yep. is a facial surgeon. And we started talking about um, human expressivity and how best to use artificial intelligence to capture and understand all of the signals that we give off, all the non-verbal cues that we give off that uh, that um, show our emotional state and, and emotional response to stimulus. Right. And that led over time to us uh, filing um, some patents uh, and starting a company, uh, MTech, on the back of that, which has now been going for the best part of five years. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a very deep tech business. Uh, and has taken quite a long time in R&D to pull together the core proof of uh, those initial patents mm -hmm. such that we can actually get that ready for commercialization, which we've now started to do in right. the midst of COVID in 2020. That was our commercialization year, which was perfect timing. Yeah. So it's been a really interesting uh, journey with the company uh, and you know uh, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the technology but, but you know just first of all just yeah. giving a bit more picture yeah uh, so my background actually is uh, as I say my I have a degree in artificial intelligence from Edinburgh University which I got in the early 1990s uh -huh. uh, back when everybody asked me what on earth I was doing such a useless degree for <laughs> Uh, and went through the um, you know the first round of uh, of, of image recognition um, systems and um, expert systems, which were the peak of AI capabilities back then. Mm -hmm. uh, through the doldrums of the uh, early two thousands and into the revolution that AI has now brought us in the last uh, decade, and is just really only starting to to motor. Um, I worked in big consultancies, uh, so IBM Global Global Services, particularly across um, Northern Europe, mm -hmm. Holland, Germany, France, uh, and the UK. Uh, and along the way, started a couple of uh, businesses. Actually, my first startup was whilst I was still at university, which uh, um, which lasted a year after I left uni and before I went into consultancy. And then I started a cybersecurity business. Um, using AI to recognize early signs of hack attack, which was based in Edinburgh. Uh, and I built over um, nearly 10 years before selling to uh, Dell, uh, Dell security arm um, in 2010, wow. uh, where after I ran Dell's um, security division for Europe, Middle East and Africa for a couple of years before realizing that big companies are really not my thing. Uh, and exiting in order to start new projects. Um, along the way, I moved from Scotland to Brighton um, mm -hmm. in order to get as far south as possible and <laughs> get a bit of warmth. Uh, and because uh, because I had um, family down here, yeah. and um, uh, and so MTech started um, in a new location for me with a in a, an environment where I wasn't as well established in terms of uh, business network and uh, and connections. Uh, and has 
built out in a very different way. So a much, uh, as I say, a much more research and development focused business, um, really genuinely novel technologies, uh, and a new approach to solving the problem of, uh, of effective computing, of teaching computers how to understand our uh, human beings real intent, what we really mean rather than just what we say, okay. that I think has real promise for the future. Absolutely. No, it sounds incredibly exciting. I think it's, it's fair to say that you know, how, how different is the landscape or the attitude towards artificial intelligence from when you, you know, completed your degree to where it is today? It seems to be spoken about it by every company and many conversations that we're having. Um, and I guess the technology has moved on leaps and bounds since then. Yeah, well, actually, you know, some of the core techniques that are used now are still exactly the same as they were back right. then. So, you know, I, in an undergraduate degree, I was studying um, convoluted neural networks um, mm -hmm. back in 1990, which is still um, the core approach for uh, for deep learning solutions today. Okay. Uh, I, I tend to think that we, as a society, we refer to artificial intelligence as anything which sounds like something that only humans should be able to do. Right. Uh, and that and that's a, therefore it's a moving target. So when I was at university, the state of the art was character recognition from images. Mm -hmm. And my professor's work was actually um, quite scandalously used whilst I was at university in order to uh, to tra translate images from um, CCTV right. on motorways to track Arthur Scargill's flying pickets as they moved around the country <laughs> so the police could get there, could get there in, ahead of them. Uh, which my university professor was uh, was suitably outraged by. Yeah. Uh, now these days, you know, every time you enter and leave a car park, your number plate gets red, and yep. you don't think twice about it. So we don't think of that as AI anymore. Back mm -hmm. then, and that was that was AI wizardry, and, uh, and people could barely believe it was possible. So, you know, we we move those boundaries of what we think computers should be capable of doing, and I think that will continue to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... MTech was born out of a relative chance meeting, and uh, it's fair to say it's got its groundings in the in the health industry. A lot of work you do. Yes, is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of work that I guess you've been working towards and that you do do today is around um, helping to assess, diagnose, and treat various. Yeah, so the the, um, the the core mission of the business is to produce uh, techniques that will help us better understand and thereby treat uh, mental illnesses. Yeah. So despite everything that we've been through in 2020, the real big epidemic in the world is actually uh, mental illness rather than coronavirus uh, in terms of the number of lives that it blights. And of course, the pandemic and all the restrictions that, have brought the, that, it, that it has brought has actually increased that. Mm. Um, so before, before COVID started, there were some 300 million people clinically diagnosed with um, with anxiety disorder in the world, uh, and that number has uh, has undoubtedly risen, um, you know, twofold. Uh, last year in the UK, there were more prescriptions for antidepressants handed out than there are actual living people in the country. Wow. Uh, so you know, it's, this is a major problem, and the state of the art for um, for diagnosing and treating most uh, clinical um, anxiety disorders and um, uh, uh, mental disorders, um, you know, emotional disorders, yeah. is is simply self-reporting. It's asking, how do you feel? Yeah. Uh, the objective evidence to understand um, the effectiveness of treatment, both in the moment and over time, mm. just doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, and our core mission is to provide that objective evidence by being able to measure and track mood and mood change. Mm. We are able to provide critical clinical evidence into the process of treatment, whether that's talking therapies, drug therapies, whatever it might be, yeah. being able to actually understand what works and what effect these treatments have on people. Yeah. So how um, or when would um, you become involved in in a process of of identifying and, and, and assessing someone's uh, sort of disposition or, or, or vulnerability. Um, you know where, where there's the sort of wearable technology and and the um, and the technology that you guys have the products that you've built fit into early sort of diagnosis and or will yeah. it in the future. 
Yeah, so we so there are a, there are a number of areas in the process where we believe we can have significant impact. But our first step in that journey uh, is our integration into virtual reality systems. So we have a a set of biometric wearable sensors that we have integrated into virtual reality headsets that allow us to objectively measure emotional state and emotional response to the uh, the simulated environment that is presented in VR. Okay. Now that can be used in a variety of ways and the, the way that we're working um, with the medical industry to build a, um, a, a medical intervention to aid anxiety treatment mm -hmm. is in using virtual reality as a way to help people um, gain um, controlled exposure to the source of their anxiety. Okay. Right. So, so in, in a talking therapies approach in cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, mm -hmm. you're given mental techniques and tools to help improve your mindfulness, to improve your, 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 uh, your, your, your sense of well-being and your state, and to be able to control your, your anxiety when you are faced with whatever it is that causes that. Yeah. Um, but clearly you then need to practice that and virtual reality, a simulated environment provides the best possible way to practice exposure to an, a source of anxiety in a controlled and safe manner. Mm. By adding in biometric sensors that actually read the, the visible signs of emotional response, we're able to provide the therapist and the patient with critical information about the level of stress response that we're seeing in the person, right. how triggered they are in, an, in, a, in a moment, how well they're controlling that situation. Yeah. And then longitudinally over time, being able to show that, that repeat therapy, gradual exposure mm -hmm. to the sort of source of anxiety in, with the control actually improves their condition. So uh, both improving CBT in the moment and also demonstrating critical evidence of its success over time using virtual reality. Amazing. Uh, I mean, this is groundbreaking stuff that you guys are involved with. And obviously with the five years of R&D behind it, how close or when will we begin to perhaps see some of these um, products and practices uh, involved in kind of mainstream yeah. um, therapy? So, um, so we, we, we've been selling our system for, to clinical psychologists and researchers for a little while now. Uh -huh. And our v, VR integrated technology exists in pretty much every continent of the world being used for um, uh, investigation and experimentation into exactly these fields, into mental health and emotional response. Um, our progress towards a medical device and the clinical trials for um, integrating into the CBT therapy are progressing. Um, we have a um, actually a, a nearly two and a half million pounds worth of funded R&D driving uh, the development of this platform with the clinical experimentation and development of proof into uh, social anxiety, general anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder happening both in the UK and in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Uh, over the next 18 months. Wow. So the answer to your question, how long for as the medical device integrated into treatment, it's probably still two years before you can see that as part mm -hmm. as a potential NHS mm -hmm. purchased solution. Okay. Uh, it, I hope it will be available for some limited private practice sometime before that. Um, we have by necessity had to slow down some of that clinical data collection over the last few months because of COVID and the, just the ability to run uh, field trials mm -hmm. is, um, is much limited access to NHS resources, access to um, physical access to patients, et cetera. But we're still, you know, we're 18 months away from being able to certify the system mm -hmm. as a full medical device with the clinical evidence that, that sits behind it. Okay. So in the meantime, it will continue to be used in um, academic and some um, corporate well-being environments mm -hmm. uh, for similar purposes. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, exciting times. And over those um, five years, you've built a team of people primarily here in Brighton? Or primarily, yes. Uh, although um, across 2020, we made a decision to 
um, to loosen that um, that that requirement a little yep. bit, and I have ended up with employees in the north of England, yep. uh, one in uh, Ireland, yep. and actually a couple in North Macedonia. Oh, would you okay. believe? Um, so we now have a much more geographically diverse team than we did at the start yep. of the year. But uh, but the the office and the core of the company is still very much here in Brighton. Yeah. Okay. Um, and. Being relatively new to the city when you were undergoing, um, you know, creating Intech and uh, and starting out on this adventure, how did you find um, accessing the right talent that you needed and expanding that business network that you alluded to at the top of the conversation? Did you find that it was a a, a good option, a good city for you to be able to embark on that journey and create the, the team that you needed? Yeah, it's a good question. So. Um, I, you know, I think to start off with, I, 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 it's worth saying that it, I did make it more challenging for myself by through this move. You know, for without blowing my own trumpet too much, I was a decent-sized fish in a relatively small pond in yeah. Scotland uh, with a very good network, and managed to remove myself significantly from that and make the decision to bring my family down to uh, uh, down to the mm -hmm. south coast. And Brighton has always got this slightly odd relationship with London mm. where there, there's a huge amount of talent down here but quite a lot of it pretends that they're really in yeah. London. Um, I've read a couple of times that one of the, the the rate of limited company formation in Brighton is higher than pretty much anywhere else in the UK but a lot of that is for one man yeah. um, contract uh, uh, creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there's a lot of that, you know, people have decided to move out of London and have that slightly alternative lifestyle. Yeah. So coming from a capital city like Edinburgh, I initially found Brighton quite frustrating in looking for where the, the where is the, that this, this uh, wealth of um, ambitious growth startups yeah. rather than small lifestyle yeah. businesses. But actually, once you start scratching under the surface, there's a huge amount mm -hmm. of talent down here, particularly in uh, the creative related mm -hmm. industries. So uh, across the field of software mm -hmm. development and um, particularly into things like Unity, yeah. which is the development environment that we use for virtual reality development. There's huge amounts of strength and depth down here. Yeah. And it's, it's a, uh, there, there's an actually, uh, there's actually increasingly uh, uh, quite a spark to the community, yeah. I feel. Um, so it's, it's a fair distance behind Edinburgh, where I came from, but then, you know, that is a capital city and, uh, uh, it has its own strengths. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think, notably so, over the last two to three years, we've seen some of those businesses that, or types of businesses that you mentioned previously, lifestyle business or smaller SaaS product-driven businesses that have got noticed or have managed to um, go on that scale-up journey, and that in itself has created a bit of buzz, um, as well as some of the sort of you know community work that we're doing here in the city. But I think that you know, it is becoming more competitive. Um, with the changing landscape on the contract side of the market, we are seeing more talent that was previously commuting up to London and now having their hands forced in, in terms of their working situation, actually deciding that they want to you know, stay here in Brighton for work and leisure. So um, hopefully that will continue over the next two or three years. But yeah, the, as you mentioned too as well, in terms of the gaming and virtual reality immersive technology landscape, it's got to be one of the hotspots, I would say, here in the UK. We've got Unity based yeah. here, obviously, yourselves and a few other um, uh, really exciting uh, and kind of cutting edge immersive technology businesses, coupled with you know a, 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 dearth, a wealth of, of gaming studios here that kind of go under the radar a little bit, but will again incorporate some of the technology that, that you guys uh, uh, use heavily, um, which we'll move on to. Really interested to hear about how that technology, you know, how you got involved in that, how that underpins your product. So could you tell us a bit more about the technology behind um, the products that create the platform that you use? Yeah, of course. Um, so so the, core of, um, the core of our work is in reading and interpreting um, signals from the human head. Um, I wanted specifically to um, to avoid use of cameras in uh, interpreting mm -hmm. expression for a, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, I'm a fundamental believer that uh, the, our emotional expression is individualistic and can't be completely um, um, it can't be completely for, formalized. So, you know, your, your your use of a smile 
will be subtly different mm -hmm. from mine. Um, the fact that you might smile more or mm -hmm. less than me doesn't mean necessarily that you are happier or mm -hmm. less happier than I am. It's just the way mm -hmm. that we're wired. And so personalized model of emotional expression mm -hmm. is pretty key. Uh, in order to build a personalized model, you need to be you need to be close to the individual in every sense mm -hmm. of the word. First of all, you need to be able to read more than one source of information about that the, of display emotional yeah. display. And second, you need to be able to read that over time repeatedly and to uh, uh, to build a classifier that works um, calibrated to the individual. And for all of those reasons, uh, plus the privacy and uh, intrusiveness of, uh, of the use of, uh, of cameras, I, I decided that we'd really need to work with physical wearables, biometric sensors yeah. rather than cameras. So we're using um, a, a, a range of primary readings from the face, which start with the uh, electrical activity that underlies the muscle movements right. of the face, from which we can reconstruct a fairly detailed understanding of your um, expressivity. So this is fundamentally different from being able to replicate your face. So we're not a motion capture okay. studio that can take you and recreate mm -hmm. you digitally because we're not looking at the movement of your skin. We're actually looking at the intent that lies behind your expression, the actual electrical muscle trigger, the, the electrical activity that triggers the muscle, which is which is wired directly right. from your brain, which means that we're able to read micro expressions, really, really small triggered flickers of emotion that might even not show very much on your face, depending on how saggy yeah. your skin is or whatever. Um, secondly, we're reading um, heart rate okay. information uh, from the forehead, uh, both heart rate itself, heart rate variability, uh, and also breathing information that we can read from um, from the oxygenation of your blood. Uh, and lastly, we're reading the uh, the type and quantity of movement of your head right. and upper body using uh, using IMUs in the system. You put all those together, and we get a multimodal approach using um, using deep learning we, uh, that that can interpret and learn your your personal method of emotional expression. So a short calibration period uh, and a couple of exercises then allows us to read how strongly you are reacting and in what direction to whatever stimulus you're right. provided with in virtual reality. I mean, it, it, when, you, when, you, when you explain it like that, you kind of, uh, it's got me thinking that, you know, that um, where else could this, this kind of technology or this approach potentially be used? Um, and obviously, you know, you're very much within the um, the health sector um, and so on. Do you see this going across industry, or are you c completely focused on um, sort of refining the the product and the, the platform for for the, the medical and health sector? Well, so we, so we do have this, um, you know, a, a, a core mission to um, uh, to help. Uh, to help humanity with the technology, and that genuinely is what drives all the all the people yeah. in the organisation. It also means that the standards that we're held to, uh, the standards of scientific rigor yeah. and clinical evidence that we're held to in the data we produce, is the highest possible. But you're absolutely right. Um, the ability to interpret emotional response has uh, applications that go way beyond mm. healthcare. Um, and we are exploring some of those. And in fact, we've, you know, we've kind of been, our hand has been forced a little bit across COVID to look at some of the non-healthcare right. applications, specifically because the healthcare industry has been so single track this year and, and our ability to access, access it so yeah. much more limited. So for example, whilst at one end of the spectrum, we're helping people with anxiety disorders improve their response yeah. to stress, this, this same spectrum at the other end of the scale, helping people to deal with other stressful situations. So what you would call resilience training for say okay. blue light personnel, how do, how do fire uh, fighters or ambulance personnel deal emotionally and with the stress of turning up in some of the incredibly difficult situations that they have to handle, or even a very small end of that, that scale, helping people to uh, to uh, present yep. better in front of audiences. It's mm -hmm. a stressful activity that is improved through practice and exposure. And if you add actual objective measurement into the that practice and exposure, you give deliver the best possible outcome for people's delivery. So they understand when they are showing their stress and how well they mm -hmm. are controlling it 
through actual measurements that can be seen on screen in real time as they're going through the exercises. So, yes, we've looked at some of the um, the non-medical applications as well, which are yeah, very absolutely. exciting. Um, so, from how big is the team now? How, how big is the business now? Uh, 23 we're 23 staff. staff. Um, as I say, we're uh, geographically yeah. a bit spread now, but uh, but yeah, the majority and of And how is right. that made up in terms of sort of technical, non-technical, what's the kind of um, you know, disciplines and, and roles that you have within that team? We are overwhelmingly <laughs> technical still. Well. So uh, the, the, the commercial delivery is really still limited to uh, myself. Uh, we ha I have a, uh, a very uh, capable and experienced marketing manager um, and um, some members of the R&D team uh, provide consultancy and pre-sales um, input. But the commercial team otherwise is extremely limited. Oh, I should point out yeah. that I also have a CFO, a okay. full-time CFO in the business who, uh, who mm -hmm. takes a full board role. Um, but really the next stage of our development is to uh, commercialize and to capitalize on our opportunity as we're moving somewhat out of R&D phase through into the commercial phase. The next stage of growth and hiring will be in that commercial side uh, and our aim is in 2021 to land a significant series a that will allow us to really um, turn up the dial and accelerate that uh, commercialization okay, and go to market. Fine. so um how has your role changed from uh from the when the business was started from inception to, to how where it is today uh, yeah well you know hugely so like any small company um, owner you know the, the both the joy and the frustration of it is that you turn your hand yeah. to absolutely everything as you do it you know so uh, my official titles encompass both ceo and cto uh, which in a in a technology intensive business like that that's already really more than i should yeah. be uh, dealing with um having also also fulfilling the role of coo at the moment and that commercial go to market is really stretching me to uh, to breaking point and that's really the addition that's grown over time so you know if i look across the five years um the first phase was all cto it was actually let's um like that we filing yeah. the uh, the patents proving the basic technologies building a demonstrator the ceo role starts to kick in as you get into uh, the investment cycle um, I, I, you know, we've picked up, I think, um, 17, um, high net worths who have, um, who have, uh, uh, angels right. who have put money into the business. Plus we also now have a, an institutional VC investor inside the business, uh, which, who we brought in, uh, to lead our seed round, uh, which happened mm -hmm. in 2019. Uh, and now that CEO role is, is has become right. significant as the team has grown from um, a handful of people to 23, which requires yep. that next layer of management and increasingly into that operational uh, commercial side as we need, as we really need to build a sales and marketing team that uh, the stand and deliver on their own two feet. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love the fact that I get to do very different yep. things on different days and wear lots of different hats and, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, the role for me right now is about understanding how best to push down responsibility into mm -hmm. the next layer of management in the team and to fill the remaining key gaps so that we can actually execute yeah. effectively next year like i think you know why why is it it's a it's an often said thing but the wisest thing i've uh, ever heard is that you always hire yeah. people who are smarter than you are uh, and and if i have any talent uh, I say that. and the, the, when you mentioned you had a, a group of uh, high net worth angel investors um, something that people in my network are um, sometimes coming to me with is, you know, we've got this great product, you know, we've proved its, um, its suitability for the market, you know, how do we get access to these type of people? Obviously being, a, you know, an experienced business person, you would have called upon your network or where do you find these people that may be able to support that growth early on? Yes. Well, that was one of the things I made harder for myself by coming to Brighton. So. Uh, you know, I was physically a long way away from the yeah. uh, from the network that I had. So whilst I still leverage that, I, I couldn't leverage it in quite the way that I could have done if I was 
uh, wearing the tartan and waving the mm -hmm. uh, waving the saltar in the process, you know. So the the appetite to invest in a South of England business is is less than it would have been uh, for a, for another Edinburgh business. Um, we absolutely uh, mined our available networks as hard as possible uh, and uh, put effort into mm -hmm. building that out. Uh, we were lucky in doing so in finding two or three key individuals who themselves okay. introduced us to yeah. uh, to others. Um, you know, there, there's in terms of what can I offer there in terms of yeah. uh, words of wisdom or advice. Um, it's really just about, you know, if you've got a, a, a good proposition that is really tightly defined and well described for the, mm -hmm. for your for your audience. And if you're looking at people who are putting in, you know, 10 yeah. to 25,000 rather than 100 to 500,000, yeah. it needs to be tailored to that end. Why, why would they put their private money in? What are they going to get out of it? Um, making sure that you're explaining something that might be very complex yeah. down to a level that um, s that somebody who's not wow. in your industry can really understand uh, and, and getting out there. So, yeah, it, it, it's taken a lot of effort and a lot of time to build that up. But um, yeah, OK, it's thanks for that. Um, and in terms of, I guess, building a sort of minimum viable product or building something that you would, could prove would, would actually work, Given that you're in R and D phase for for um, you know a relatively long time, it's quite easy now to sort of spin up a you know a work in the cloud and build a SaaS product. It, not so easy to do something as complex as you have done. How much of a working product did it need to be um, for you to be able to um, call upon you know not just the angel investors but perhaps the seed round in 2019? Is that the kind of four years work that went into being able to get to that stage? Would you say? Yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We, we've we uh, on a technical level, we've set ourselves a, um, a a crazy challenge, really. You know, when I when I look at what yeah. what I what we took on now, it, it it's almost laughable because we have we have hardware, we have firmware, we have um, uh, Android um, yeah. uh, machine learning and yeah. uh, an application level. We have Unity VR software. We then have cloud communication protocols. We have a Windows application. We have uh, we have cloud storage, and then we have an entire um, uh, machine learning stack that is running yeah. in Amazon Web Services that is actually doing the deep interpretation. So, whilst I've got maybe fifteen technical mm -hmm. staff in the company, actually, when you realise the the breadth mm -hmm. of our technical estate. I don't have a lot of strength and depth across that, so it's actually still quite a yeah. minimal development team for that kind of scale. It's not. It's not like it's a, yeah, a you know sure. a web app and you're done. So which would be a, that would be a sure. fantastic development team then. Uh, so yeah. So I've got one or two right. people in each of those. Uh, and those how easy has it been really. to, given that you've got that multidisciplinary team, but it's relatively light in terms of depth? How easy has it been to? Get all those people working together and integrating different parts of the sort of packaged up solution. Yeah, hard. Um, I, I won't. I absolutely won't deny that. It, it ta it's taken a lot of effort. Um, I now have um, uh, a technical architect who um, has. He actually yeah. joined us as a contractor. I've managed to persuade him into a permanent role, and he's now taking a lead role uh, okay. in binding things together. Um, a scrum master and um, uh, a person prim primarily responsible for yeah. um, test and QA. These these are you know these are the the kind of glue that allows us to build a team yeah. that can operate across the space. And then, as I said before, you know just you know uh, investing in people who are hugely responsible, hugely dedicated and, yeah. uh, and well, it's clear you've got a sort of fantastic mission in terms of what you're trying to achieve coupled with really really interesting technology it's going to be an opportunity i would have thought um, that people would, would want to be involved with um that speaks for itself in, in terms of sort of what would you say the the culture of an mtech employee is or what sort of characteristics do you um primarily look for, uh, for for somebody to to join join the business uh, yeah so that's a that's a great question so 
people who are um, uh, who are yep. uh, collaborators first and foremost, uh, but people who take okay. uh, responsibility, who people who uh, who want to own and drive their a process or a technology uh -huh. stack or whatever it is that they are critically responsible for people who are willing to um mm -hmm. willing to fail and fail fast uh not not afraid to make mistakes and not afraid to talk about them and actually even to celebrate our mistakes as we uh, uh, as we make them yeah. because they're the best learning opportunities that we have um and people who have a uh, a, a spark and an enthusiasm for the work that we have that is that is visible that goes beyond just the it's a cool mm. company and an interesting bunch of people so people who really buy into uh the mission and the possibility that we have that you know those are the fundamental base characteristics and i value those above uh above experience okay, absolutely um, so. and in terms of the sort of next 12 months you mentioned that you know building out that kind of commercial function and beefing that out for you to be able to implement the go-to-market strategies is, is imperative. Um, what, what else is in the in the pipeline for you guys over the next year or so? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, if, if I um, yeah. uh, boil that down to its essentials, you've got on the commercial side, we're building up, building up and building out the uh, the the sales channels both into um, research and increasingly into the medical community uh, and looking at how our enterprise wellness okay. um, offering could actually come together at the same time in the research and development side of things where we we've got three critical clinical trials that have to kick off and mm -hmm. two of them to finish in 2021 which will provide the underlying uh, data and evidence yeah. to support the delivery of our VR system as a uh, as a medical device, and also will support the next stage of development in our in our even more cutting edge product, which is the ability to read all the same data but in a normal pair of glasses yeah. instead of in virtual reality. So we have a whole next generation tool set that the R and D department are working on, which we have funded projects. It's amazing to well. be doing all this with only um, 23, 26 people, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so yeah. That, I, but, but that's the final point, which you've set up for me perfectly, which is that we've got to, yeah. uh, we've got to nail the Series A in 2021 to give ourselves the legs to be able to really yeah. do all of this technology justice. So. Uh, we are doing very well mm. with what is really a very small team. Um, that needs to close to double in order to really take advantage of the opportunity space we've got in front of us. And that requires a solid right. um, commercial. It sounds hugely exciting. And a question that's um, been on my mind, given the kind of bureaucracy red tape that um, various countries have around introducing medical devices, medical technology um, into sort of the mainstream. Um, I know you mentioned that primarily UK and Netherlands were part of the trials that you were um, uh, undergoing at the moment. How easy is it once you've got that kind of seal of approval to be able to take this to the US or other North American countries? Or, or how is it easy will it be to take this globally once you've got um, you know, an initial kind of sort of blueprint of approval? Or difficult. Um, well, so you hit on the U you hit on the US first of all. So in the US, um, they yeah. have the FDA, which is their own um, uh, medical device approvals okay. process, which we will have to go through, uh, and we will almost undoubtedly have to uh, create and develop um, more right. clinical evidence in the right. US in order to complete that process. Um, so we are already selling um, our uh, te our pl technology platform for mm -hmm. research purposes in the US, but as a medical device which could yep. be paid for by insurance, mm -hmm. that is some distance away at the moment. It's probably, you know, that's an additional 18 months of work uh, which needs to be properly funded. And it's something that we will consider mm -hmm. with the Series A uh, and, uh, and obviously makes a difference mm -hmm. where that money is actually found. Whether it is that UK yeah. money, is it actually US money? That's an interesting conversation to be had under there. Uh, Europe, theoretically, 
Um, uh, everything right. we do in the UK is valid across Europe, but I have to say theoretically, because we've got this thing happening at New Year yeah. that you might have heard of, which uh, which you know, nobody's clear about what the hell it means to any of us. Uh, we are, we, we are, however, working on a um, European yeah. funded project, which I mentioned earlier, which is based in the Netherlands. And we are building a PTSD management solution in the Netherlands yeah. using a Dutch clinical population as the trial data there. Yeah. So we will get U European medical approvals. And um, that is a much more directly accessible market okay. for the medical price right. in the short term. And in terms of um, getting into various um, new markets and territories and so on, will it always be uh, a kind of standalone um, M-Tech product and solution or will there be, would it be easier or will there be possibilities for you to partner with perhaps larger companies that have a footprint uh, in those in those countries? Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, what you know, for, first and foremost, what we're building is a, a platform for interpreting uh, biometric signals back into emotional state, which needs uh, it needs a use case that goes on the top of it. So we're already partnering with organizations well, okay. who are building mental health um, solutions. Uh, so we're building our platform yeah. as a developer friendly solution right. for third parties of all types to say, what could I do with emotional data? How can I use that inside mm -hmm. my game, my experience, my simulation, right. whether that be for medical purposes or for training or even for gaming. Um, the second uh, piece to mention is that well, our focus and our, our secret source, if you like, is more around the interpretation right. of data than it is the collection of data itself. And we are already in talks with various manufacturers about potentially incorporating our sensor arrays into their technology sets, which would give a wider footprint of uh, delivery of the hardware. Right, that we yeah, that makes a, sense. A small um, business ourselves. And have you noticed, obviously this year has been challenging uh, for obvious reasons in terms of healthcare, um, that the funding or attitude towards supporting innovation within mental health has changed over the past few years? Um, the interest and spend on mental health has, has gone up dramatically in the last few years. Obviously this year, the, the focus has been yeah. very specifically on one thing. But the fallout of that, for example, the uh, incidence of PTSD in hospital staff this year has been through the roof. Uh, and we um, we have picked up on some pretty interesting avenues of approach to help um, with uh, with the treatment of some of the yeah. side effects of the pandemic, for example. So, yes, I think the, the world is waking up to uh, mm -hmm. the importance of mental health in a big way. I think it touches on all of us in a way that it mm -hmm. that it didn't um, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but it's a um, it's a. Uh, it's a treatment regime, a process, and an associated business marketplace, which is still in great flux and in early development. There's a lot more to do in there. For you know, that fundamental starting point. There's so little objective data supporting the effectiveness of mental health treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Is, uh, well, I mean, as you say, uh, hopefully that increase in um, awareness does seem to be. Um, you know, gathering pace consistently now for, you know, for good reasons, for bad reasons, but essentially we, we seem to be going in the right direction. And I think, you know, the innovation behind the, the products that you guys are creating um, will hopefully go to some, some way accelerating what has been a, a big problem for accelerating the solution to a degree of what's been a big problem for, for too long. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to seeing how um, how that develops and how that, how that grows. Um, and in terms of, you know, there's a lot of young um, talent and there's a lot of sort of R&D type um, initiatives that I've seen that have sort of sprouting in the city at the moment. Um, what advice would you give to anybody starting out um, on, on, on a journey or, or, you know, advice to somebody that was in your position maybe five years ago for the key things to them to nail early with regards to finding a gap in the market or product development to, in that sense? Well, I think I think one of the things that's been a revelation to me in MTech compared to any previous ventures is the appetite that exists in the UK to fund and, and support genuinely innovative businesses. So if we're talking about people who have ideas for things which are genuine 
uh, inventions and particularly inventions that that have a chance of yeah. helping the um, UK population in some form, you know, whether that be medical or societal or whatever, the, there is funding out there. Uh, it, it's a, it's a skill set all by itself to land research and yeah. development grants from Innovate UK mm -hmm. and, and the like. But the funding is fantastic. It's non-dilutive. Um, it's incredibly supportive. Mm -hmm. They're an amazing organization, Innovate UK. And um, if if there is something that you're developing that you could patent in the process, you really should be looking at R&D uh, grant applications and understanding what might be possible there. There, as I say, there's lots. Of, you, you can have a whole conversation about how you go about applying and how on, on what success mm -hmm. looks like. But just knowing that it's there as a support and a way to drive early investment into a business without yeah. uh, losing chunks of equity in the process is Fantastic. It's, really valuable really advice. Um, and I'll include some of the um, sort of resources where you could find some more information around that um, once we broadcast this. So thanks very much for that. That'd be really helpful. Um, um, well, that, I guess that, that draws us to, to a close, really. I think we've, you know, it's, it's left me really excited to, you know, see what the future holds for you guys and also how this is going to, you know, help to change that uh, that industry for the better. Um, I think it's fair to say for, for those watching and listening that, you know, it's certainly one to, to, to keep an eye on as we move into next year and, you know, watch the growth and monitor the progression of the business. Um, and you know, we'll certainly, uh, as as far as Silicon Bright is concerned, do all we can to uh, shine a spotlight on businesses like yourselves who are using tech for for good and, and and making really positive impacts in the industry. So, fingers crossed, we can get back to some more in-person uh, meetups and events slowly but surely. We'll get there, and um, yeah, we can't wait to, to, to shout about you guys uh, more as as we as we approach that. Thanks very much. It's great to speak to you.